Alex, welcome back. Thank you. It must be pretty good to be back on Joyland here in Gosport with the team. How are you feeling? I mean, obviously gutted with what happened and, and how things turned out, but you know, we're, we're very good at recovering and, uh, and it's good to be back home with the family and be able to start the planning process and, and looking at how that affects our future. I want to just go back a little bit and talk about um, the days and weeks leading up to the TJV. Kind of going into that race, what was the objective? Obviously, this is the first race um, on board the new Hugo Boss. Um, you were very measured in your approach to this race. It sounded a lot like um, you know you and Neil were very much going into this um, as a learning experience. Tell me a little bit about um, what the approach was ahead of the TJV. Well, the, I think our, the, the, our approach for this Transaction Javab was affected by the Transaction Javab we did four years ago. So the big idea really was to uh, avoid a major problem uh, and, and, and was to, to really get to the finish and to learn as much as possible about the boat that would then inform our future development decisions. And um, obviously, you know, we, we saw the first... A uh, few days, week of the race, um, a lot happened in those kind of initial seven days. How was the performance of the boat um, in the early stages of the race? Was it still very much a we're learning how to sail this machine, or you know, how did it feel for you and Neil? Yeah, very much so. You know, we'd never sailed the boat against another boat, so we really had no, you know, no, no accurate gauge of, of where we were compared to other boats, and uh, and so yeah, it was very much. Let's point it in the right direction and, and then find out how to make it go fast. And you know, sometimes we did that fairly quickly, and we felt like the boat was fast. And other times it looked, took a bit longer. And then, you know, there are some occasions where we're still scratching our head, wondering what we have to do. So uh, fairly normal stuff with this kind of boat. I, I think overall we'd say we're we're very pleased with the performance. Um, I, I think we think we we've, we've got something a bit more rounded than the last boat. And uh, yeah, I think we're, we're, we're very happy and excited to be able to get back in the water and find out some more. Around seven days into the race, unfortunately, you and Neil hit something in the water. Talk us through exactly what happened. Um, it was morning, sun was up, beautiful blue sky, champagne sailing, <laughs> uh, very flat water, metre to a metre and a half, and uh, I think we had 13 to 16 knots of wind or something. Uh, we were sailing uh, with a reaching sail, uh, a staysail, and uh, the mainsail. And we were doing about 24, 25 knots. Uh, Neil, Neil had, was just about to go for a sleep, so he'd just gone outside the cockpit and was sat, well, was very close to, the, to that bulkhead. I was behind the pedestal, although I, Neil has to tell me I was behind the pedestal because I can't really remember. And then we hit something in the water and the boat came to a complete stop and uh, Neil was, was pushed hard up against the bulkhead very quickly, and I was thrown forwards uh, and ended up on the floor in the cockpit. Neil, Neil said, Neil's, Neil saw me fly, and he thought, my God, he's gonna break his, his, his neck, must be broken. But um, I think for both of us, we were both just a bit shocked. Uh, both a bit hurt, you know, Neil had some sore ribs, and I was bruised, and I feel like I've chipped a bone in my elbow, and. Uh, and both initially just a bit in shock, really, I think, you know, we were both a bit shocked. And if, if so, when somebody goes into shock, I know what it feels like. I definitely went into shock. You know, I felt a bit sicky, I went very hot, and, you know, felt like my blood pressure dropped. Uh, and, and, and it was a bit stunning, to be honest. I mean, it was a, it was a car crash. It was but a car crash that you didn't know was going to happen. And, uh, and obviously not strapped in or not ready for it. And how quickly are you able to respond in a situation like this? Is it, you know, is it a sense of sheer panic or is it a very quickly, okay, we, we have to regroup and figure out what's happened and stabilise the boat? So when, we, when it happened, we very quickly broached, effectively went into the wind and, and we were leaning over a long way. In, in the process of the, of the stop, you know, there was a very nasty cracking sound so you're aware, first of all, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out, I was lying on the floor trying to figure out, are all, are all the bits still attached? Is it all working? You know, you've, you, I'm aware that I'm in shock. I'm aware you're trying to compute what just happened. And, you know, we're stopping in, you know, a fraction of a second. We're, 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 it's, a, it's, it's, try, it's quite hard to actually compute what actually happened. I mean, I can't really remember where I was. The only reason I know where I was was because Neil told me. So you're trying to compute what happened. You heard some noises. 
you, you're in shock, you're trying to figure out whether your body's hurt. You're aware that I'm aware that I'm, I'm, I'm in shock. Um, and and it's certainly not panic. It's firstly a case of, you know, am I okay? Can I stand up? Or nearly are you okay? You know, we're checking each other out. And then you kind of get to the stand up stage. A bit of, you know, you really are in a bit of pain and bending over. And then, and then you're starting to wonder what happened. And, and I think at that point, it's very easy for me where I was standing just to, to, to look into the pit area where the, where the keel is. And uh, I think I said to Neil, I can see daylight in the pit. Uh, and, and of course, it's interesting how people's brains compute different times. Of course, Neil thinks daylight in the pit means the keel's not there, which means we're leaning over at the moment at 60 degrees, so we're probably going to capsize. Ah, oh my God. So, so he had to have a quick look at the keel. And then it was then really we realized the kill was not where it should be, but it was still there. It was being, you know, it was, it was being uh, held by the hydraulic ram. So essentially the kill had, had dropped out of the boat and was being hung, you know, being held there. So it meant we weren't going to capsize. Um, and then you're trying to think through all the things you have to do. I think, I can't remember, remember exactly now, but did, did we had to check the boat. Did we, we check to see whether there was a big, huge hole in the front of the boat and was the you know, was the bow falling off, what was going on? So a quick look at that, and, and then decide the quickest way to make the boat into a safe situation, which was, you know, get rid of the big sails, get rid of the mainsail, get rid of the jib, and, uh, and sail downwind and just try to stabilize the platform, make it flat, and, and, then, and then start the process of trying to figure out what happened. But there, definitely there's not a panic. There's a, there's a, a, you know, trying to figure out through the fog of your mind, through the shock of what's happened, you know, we're talking through scenarios, what should we do now? Uh, what do you think's happened? How might that affect what we're about to do? You know, so you, you make sure that you're, you're talking through every scenario so you don't end up putting yourself in a worse situation. And once you had stabilized the boat, um, and obviously you'd been in touch with the technical team, what were the next steps? Walk me through what happened next on board. Well, firstly, when the keel was dropped out of the boat, and it's being held on by one hydraulic ram. So, so there's a ram here sitting like this that was on the top of the keel. So now, and it used to pull the keel like this forwards and uh, from side to side. So the keel's now fallen out of the bearings. And so this is now hanging like that. And the only thing to stop the keel from going vertical is the hull. So, and bear in mind now, of course, this thing can move in almost every single wherever it wants. If you, it can spin, it can go side to side, it can go front and back. And so this, you know, three, half the boat's weight is now banging and making the hole where the keel was bigger. So our first thought really along with the team was to try and see whether we could stabilize it. So we, we tried to, to, to lift it and to try and get it to the point where we could stabilize it back in its general position. Um, and so we tried various ways of hanging it and winding it up, and I mean, ultimately, we you know we tried that for a fair old time, and and in the end, we decided that you know Neil and I decided that really this wasn't a sense you know we we were in very flat water, and and any anything if the condi conditions deteriorated, we were going to make a big hole and potentially you know put the boat in jeopardy. So then, then the choice of cutting the keel off. Now for me, at that point, it was, I felt like that was the obvious decision to be made. Was I concerned about sailing around with the keel off? No, at that point, no, because if we don't get rid of the keel, we're not gonna have a boat anyway. So that, that really had to happen, that the keel had to go. Um, there were some thoughts that, that we wouldn't be able to cut through the, the hydraulic ram. Uh, in fact, we were told by the manufacturer that we wouldn't be able to cut through it with the with the tools we had on board. There was also thoughts maybe we just cut the entire structure of the boat out and get rid of it. But that felt like a little bit extreme to us at the point at that point. So, you know, it was fairly easy to make the decision and then it was a question of how do you do it safely mm. and, and how possible is it? Neil said Neil said he was fully confident that I was gonna cut it away. And and I said to him why? He said he said he said, because you were so determined if you had to Alex you were gonna bite it off. <laughs> Which uh, uh, I was pretty determined, but you know, for us, the way we look at it, you know, we, if the keel hadn't gone, then it potentially puts everything at risk, the boat at risk, the project at risk, the chance of winning the Vendée Globe in 2020 at risk. So to me, there was no real option. We did have the tools on board capable of doing it, and, and ultimately, it went. And we were desperate. We were praying, please, 
you know, it would go. It wasn't easy. You know, we, we only cut through about half of it, and then, and then because it was sat and bending, it eventually fatigued and and broke. So we were very happy with that. And any idea of what you hit? Will you, will you ever know? Uh, I, I will never know what we hit. I mean, for sure, it was very hard. Yeah. You know, I've hit. You know, I've hit a few sandbanks and a few rocks in my time. You know, I would say that felt like a rock. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that means that probably it has to be very big, uh, quite hard, but very big, because not only do you have to hit you, you, whatever you're hitting, you know, if we, if we weigh ten, 10 tons and we hit uh, something that weighs 10 tons, then we're going to move that 10 ton thing. So this felt very hard and very big. So, so it was almost a, it felt like a, a full stop. So no, no idea what it was really, and, uh, but and almost impossible to be able to tell. But I, I, as soon as it happened, and I remember lying on the floor, you know, for, for probably 30 seconds or a minute or a couple of minutes, whatever it was, and I, I was thinking to myself, I, wanna, I need to go on deck, I need to go on deck, I want to see what that was. But, you know, by the time we'd actually got ourselves sorted out and able to, to look at the priority of seeing what that was, it was, it was too late. And what about object detection? We've talked, we've had a lot about sonar technology, thermal imaging. Is that something that you as a team will potentially now be looking to explore? Well, well definitely we have to look at all scenarios now. So, so first we know we have to look at how the, keel, how the keel structure failed. We have to look at the loads, if we, can, if we can understand more about the loads. And we have to you know, look at where we can mitigate. Now, sonar technology is something that we, yes, we are looking into, we have to look at it. You know, if we didn't, we wouldn't be responsible. And there are two ways of doing this. In some ways you can, you know, there is a system that currently exists and is being tested amongst the Mocha fleet. Um, it's called an Oscar. And it, it's, it's, it's looking at thermal imaging from the top of the mast, looking forward to seeing, you know, what, what potentially is in, in the water. Um, I think we feel that what we hit was under the water. So, so I'm not sure that any thermal imaging on top of the mast is gonna help that scenario. Uh, so we are looking at what exists in the sonar world, and and you know there are there are different levels. We're nowhere near finished our our review of that, but it starts from you know essentially fish finding uh, all the way through to you know I guess there are there's torpedo you know military torpedo sonar. So you know you could be looking at something from a few hundred pounds to a few million pounds, uh, and there's the weights of it, there's the distances, there's the power. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a vast range. I do think we're getting close to the point where there is going to be something suitable within the next four or five years, perhaps. Um, are we there now? We definitely don't know. W what's important to us now is uh, the range. The range and probably the power are the two biggest points. Obviously, we, we need to stick it in the, in the bulb of the keel because it, that's the bit that's always going to be under the water. Nowadays, these boats are quite a lot out of the water, so it has to go in the bulb of the keel. Um, in terms of distance, well, if you think uh, when, you're, when you're traveling at 20 knots, that's you know, circa 10 meters a second. So if we can see 100 meters, then I've got 10 seconds to deal with it. So there's an argument to say, or, or a discussion around how long is, you know, I would think for me, 150 to 200 meters is probably the minimum that's going to be any use at all. And then what do you want to see? Do you want to hear an alarm? Do you want to see something, an image? Uh, it should it be 2D? Should it be 3D? What about alarms you know, the, around power? You know, if you imagine if we're using, on average, two to 300 watts of power, generally, on the boat, you know, if you're looking at a system that's four or 500 watts, immediately that make it, might make it very difficult. So we've got to look at it all. There's lots of discussions going on, but I think, ultimately, I think the right solution is, is, is longer term. We'll see a sonar in the, in the bulb and hopefully we'll be able to mitigate some of these risks. Of course, you're never going to mitigate all of them, but you know, the, there is rubbish in the sea, there are big mammals in the sea, there are containers in the sea, and really it's our responsibility to, to try and avoid all of these. Now, as we sit here, the boat has just arrived back in the UK. Um, I'm sure the team will be very happy to see her in one piece back in Southampton. What are the next steps? We, the next step now is to NDT it. So f first of all, we've, you know, we've had a good look at what we can see mm -hmm. of the damage. At the moment, it looks fairly local, i.e. just around the keel structure. But the keel structure is very complex. It's the most complex, highly loaded part of 
the boat and it sort of takes the longest to make. So the stage is to, is to NDT it to really understand the extent of the damage. And then we work with VBLP and with Guret to you know, prepare a, a repair package to repair, you know, to repair the situation, hopefully with no increase of weight. And, and uh, certainly we'll be looking at what happened, how it failed, and, and to see whether we can mitigate it. Should we make it stronger? Do we need, need to go above the rules? You know, what can we do to make the global situation better? And in terms of a, a setback, um, you know, how far does this set us back in terms of miles on the water? And do you have any idea yet of, of when you might be back racing again, sailing again? I mean, th this is a huge step setback for us, definitely. And, and we still don't know the extent. So firstly, we need to see how long, how big the repair is going to be and how long it's going to take. Um, it, it, it means, obviously, that we didn't finish the, the latter half of the Transit Arb, which is the number of miles. We didn't then manage to sail back. Um, to mitigate that, I think, you know, we our route to the west of in the race put us through many different wind angles and, and uh, wind strength. So we have a pretty good understanding of how the, the boat performed and we have a pretty good idea of what we'd like to do to improve the performance. So it's, um, it's certainly not all lost, but it is a, you know, it's a big uh, kick in the teeth. It's something we really didn't need, it's something we really didn't want. But you know, these situations happen. That's the nature of the sport we're in, and, and uh, you know the journey's always hard. We always knew it was going to be hard, uh, and this is just one of those things that happens. And you know we've learned how to deal with it. It's, you know the team's pretty very resilient. I think it's uh, it's it's helpful that we can see some performance, which you know we can see the boats fast. So uh, I, I I genuinely believe we're we're still in the game. We need to we need to find out how long this is going to take, and we need to try and get on the water as quickly as possible. And, you know, I'd really hope that we're back on the water by March. You know, it gives us a few months then before we do the, the New York to Vendée race in June um, and, uh, and gives us a, a real chance to still develop the performance, develop the reliability and, and make it usable. And the goal, Vendée 2020, um, does that remain the same, the objective, from a team perspective, from your own perspective? Are we still targeting that win next year? The, the, the goal for the Vendée hasn't changed. You know, we'd, I'd like to think, hopefully, that by the time we do the New York Vendée race, we're back in the situation we should be in. Yeah. So, but you know, things will change for sure. Schedules need to change. The way we approach things might change. What we try to do might change. But until we know the extent of, of uh, you know, the damage and how that affects everything else, the schedule, the plan, then uh, it, it's difficult to, to say too succinctly what we need to do. All right, thank you. It was good to talk to you. Thank you um, very much. And uh, yeah, we're very much looking forward to seeing the boat back on the water.